Hello and welcome to um, the Quagmire. Like for the first time since we started, um, usually we do interviews, but for this particular episode, we decided to do a debate between um, an anarchist, Alex, who we've had on the show before, yeah. and a Marxist Leninist. Um, we haven't had on the show before, but I can't wait to have. So introduce yourself, Tom. Uh, hello. Um, can you turn your mic up a bit? Uh, I, I'm not sure. All right, all right. So um, <laughs> I was about to say, Alex, this is how the debate's going to go. Um, so <clears throat> it's going to start with um, both of you making opening statements that are going to have a time limit of 10 minutes, but you guys can, like, you know, stop any time you want. Then, then the next section of the debate will be um, us as the host will ask you a few questions about, you know, each other's opening statements, asking if you have like any refutations for any arguments <clears throat> made in your opponents, like opening um, statements. Then it'll go into a sort of like free for discussion, which will be um, will be moderated, but it will be like you know just a free for as I said. So I think would be best for Alex um, start with your opening statement. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Aram and the MMU Philosophy Society for putting up with me for a second time, and uh, obviously the opportunity to take part in this debate. So oh, thank thank you. Uh, hopefully I can return the favour and make a, a helpful and valuable contribution to this discussion. Uh, discourse between anarchists and Marxist Leninists doesn't exactly have the best reputation. Um, but I have confidence that my opponents and I are united in the aspiration to create a positive example of dialogue between like opposive le opposing leftist positions. So that's my uh, outset for today. Uh, I'll begin by clarifying my position. So my political persuasion, as many of you know, is best categorized as an anarchist. I define anarchism as a critique of social, political, economic hierarchy on the premise that no hierarchy is justified by any ethical duty to uphold or maintain it, or that any specific power structure is essential requirement of a functional society. It's a mouthful I know, but I feel this definition ticks the necessary boxes. So this means I'm extremely critical, for example, of an organization which has asserted its authority over a given territory and uses the threat of violence to force compliance and extract funding in return for protections, privileges, etc. Even if there exists a possibility for loyal servants to work their way up the hierarchical ladder and maintain a position of influence within said organization. Uh, now, you probably thought I was talking about the state. There wasn't. I was talking about the mafia. I'm critical of the state, too, but I think a description of the mafia, I think the fact a description of the mafia can be mistaken for one of the state is a good starting point for my argument since the main difference between Marxism and Leninism and anarchism is with, with regard to um, what we should do with the state. Should we get rid of it or should we use it? Uh, the common problem with uh, MLs and anarchists when we uh, talk to each other about the state is that we actually use different definitions of the state. Uh, we don't realize this, when, and if we don't realize this, sorry, uh, we make the mistake of believing that each side wants the same end result but we just disagree on the means of getting there. Uh, however, this isn't really that true because if we have a different, di different definition of a state, then we're going to have a different idea of what a stateless society looks like and what that would involve. And so therefore our end goal is also ultimately difficult, uh, different. Uh, this calls for a far more fundamental debate than just talking about strategy, since there's little point in discussing strategy if your goals are different. Uh, if I'm asking you for directions and um, we're debating directions rather, and one's going to try and get to Manchester, and the other one's trying to get to Liverpool, then there's literally no point in discussing which was the best way to go. Um, so let's begin with looking at how Lenin defined it. Lenin defined the state uh, along the lines of an apparatus which is used by one class to pin down another within a given territory. Uh, this means that a bureaucratic organization which is responsible for planning the economy, passing laws, generally regulating the people, you know, things that anarchists want to see abolished, uh, will exist in a Leninist stateless society. So this is where our problem is going to start. Uh, I define the state as an organization which is beholden of a monopoly of force over a given territory. And for the state to maintain this, it must coerce all of its subjects into recognizing its sole claim to authority, regardless of their consent. Uh, let me elaborate. So if a state was to be voluntarily funded, for example, then it essentially becomes a large charity or protection agency which must compete with other agencies that can be also voluntarily funded by people who think these alternatives can do a better job at carrying out such functions. Uh, and the, the, what, the functions that uh, used to be carried out by what used to be the state. So what I mean is, 
the lack of monopoly on force makes this organization no different to what we recognize to be non-state actors. It just has an advantage to do this in a new market as it has more capital than the other charities or protection agencies. So uh, for a Leninist state to uh, oppress another class, uh, it will need that monopoly of force to do so. Otherwise, it's just competing with other organizations which wish to oppress the bourgeoisie. That's why I call the state. So given that anarchism is a critique of authority, we, should argue, we would argue that such a monopoly in force would need some justification beyond pointing to its functions in society. Uh, rather than telling us that we need protection, healthcare, education, etc., it would need to make an ethical claim to power that trumps the right to self-determination of its subjects so that, do, so that they do not resist this imposition and become dependent on the state to provide these things for us. Uh, the question from statists for anarchists is uh, going to be on how these functions can be carried out uh, in, without a monopoly of force so that we can live in a safe, healthy, knowledgeable society as well as a free one. Uh, whilst I don't have any kind of authority on how a free society is going to organize itself, I would suggest it does so in line with certain principles that maximize freedom, freedom and minimize hierarchy. So I predict that a free society would respect other people's right to life, autonomy, use of property, etc. And from here on, you can have a whole range of models on how a society could be organized. In some areas, can have, you can have communistic economies with heavy emphasis on mutual aid, and in others, they'd have an emphasis on market competition between worker properties. It's really dependent on how workers who directly control their workplaces and labor choose to interact with their wider communities. The reason I think such autonomy and self-determination will be a key aspect of a society which I will be favorable to comes from the philosophy of Max Stirner, uh, as set out in, his, in the book, uh, Ego on Its Own. Uh, Max Stirner uh, knew Engels on a personal basis, I mean, the illustrations of Max Stirner were actually drawn by Engels. So he knew, so Eng, uh, Stirner knew uh, Engels' philosophy inside out and basically predicted that that was what would become of the Marxist revolutions in the future. Uh, so like anarchism, the purpose of his book was to provide a philosophical case of the individual against authority. That was actually the subheading of the book. Uh, in it, Stirner reminds us that the entities such as the nation, humanity, ownership, God, the state, standards of ethics, etc., are mere intersubjective entities which have no conscious wills of their own. Uh, they only exist in the mind of individuals who become, quote-unquote, haunted when they prioritize the interests of the intersubjective, i.e. the nation, the state, humanitarian, uh, above their own. In material reality, these things do not exist, and their influence is solely dependent on people's recognition of such constructs. So, what we, need, so we need to think about why these entities should be served, should be served as opposed to uh, being used to further one's self-interest. Uh, this recognition that we have no duty to serve another or an intersubjective entity leads us to acknowledge that we'll need to respect another's autonomy and cooperate along the lines of mutual self-interest, which I think is a good start when heading towards a free society. So this is a pretty short opening statement for a two-hour debate, but I think this does enough to get the ball rolling from my end. But I'll end with this quote from Mikhail Bakunin. Uh, when a man is beaten with a stick, he is no happier if it is called the people's stick. That's me done. Perfect. Brilliant, brilliant opening statement there, Alex. Like, honestly, <clears throat> that was proper class. Like, so now I want to hear Tom's opening statement. How do you respond to something like that? Go ahead, Tom. Uh, well, I'm feeling considerably underprepared now, but thankfully, um, my opponent seems to have given me some of the definitions I was going to use myself. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just start by saying um, I'm a Marxist Leninist. Um, I'm definitely not uh, well read at least I, I wouldn't put my, call myself well read um, but uh, I do have a working understanding of the state from a Marxist perspective and our position on it um, the Marxist understanding of the state uh, we'd call it it's not the same as a nation or a country although I, I, I've, I've written out a few notes that I think are a bit redundant now given my opponent's uh, opening statement uh, but we would define it slightly differently, I think. Um, what I've written uh, is that a state is a tool of class oppression, specifically a class oppression, uh, uh, through state apparatus, institutions, i.e. the police, prisons, law, etc., um, of a ruling class over uh, a working class. Um, um, I think where our definitions will mainly differ is that from the Marxist perspective, given that we uh, base it in class oppression, we see it as a necessary product of class contradiction. Um, and to understand the state itself, we must understand the class contradiction. Um, 
so throughout human society, following like the advent of agriculture, um, there have existed classes, classes being large groups of people that can be defined by key material characteristics being their relation to means of production, i.e. do they own it or are they employed to use it, etc. Um, and the place they operate in the system, the overall social economy of that current society, and thus their interests relating to their place in that society. Um, among these classes that have existed through uh, history, of course, uh, there arises conflicts of interest. Uh, conflict of the day being that the means of production known in capitalists want to make as much profit as they can. Of course, workers want to make as much in the way of wages as they can. Of course, this is a conflict because the more that the capitalist has to pay the, the workers, the less profits they can be making from their own product and so, so on and so on. Um, and we see these contradictions throughout society, like in slave society, of course, the slaves, of course, had very different and contradictory interests to their masters, to, to make a very blunt um, um, analogy to, to this, uh, what we're seeing today, and so on. Um, so throughout history, there are these contradictions, and what Marx observed, of course, was the dialectical nature to them. Uh, but I won't get into that just now if it's not necessary. But of course, through, uh, throughout history, we've seen these contradictions. And I believe, as Engels put it, um, the state has become a product of a society that at a certain stage of development, it's, it's, it's admission that society has become entrenched in its own unstable contradiction with itself. So the, with these class contradictions, uh, it's, it's, an unstable, it's an unstable environment that they're, they're even oh, what's the word this is this is where my notes are, are failing me even the irreconcilability of class con contradictions so the these class contradictions can't be solved through a, a reform or uh, by by the just arguing it out it's it's fundamental to that society so what the state does is it formalizes the ruling class above society, as it was put by Engels. It's putting the system of class oppression into its, its own, so it can't be challenged. It's, it's a maintained system. Um, and of course, that's enforced naturally. It has to be enforced by a system of, of, of uh, violence, and the state has to hold the monopoly of violence. And that's not necessarily through um, just the police or, or by physical violence, but also economic violence against the working classes. They're being held in their position. They can't move out of their, their position in, in that contradiction. And of course, that inevitably leads to uprising and revolution when those class contradictions come to a head. Um, through understanding that, um, as a Marxist-Leninist, we understand that through revolution and through an end to capitalism, there will still exist classes. Classes do not simply disappear following that revolution. There will still be relations to means of production. There will still be different class interests. And of course, revolution doesn't happen everywhere all at once. It happens in places, in pockets. So in countries, there, is, there comes revolution. And if that ruling class of, of that particular state becomes uh, the proletariat, then in all other countries, there's still the ruling classes being the bourgeoisie. And still there's a, then a global class contradiction. So when we see that, it's, it's the, 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 the system, the fundamental existence for the state hasn't disappeared. It's still there. It's still necessitated by that class contradiction. And I think that without getting too far into making arguments that my opponent hasn't made yet is the fundamental position of, of the Marxist-Leninist. Is that your opening statement then? I, I believe that's that's about as good as I can make it. Well, um, already, Tom, I've noticed um, a falsehood in what you've said. Um, 
He said you were underprepared. I, said, I'm I'm certainly underprepared. I've written notes in no, about mate, ten minutes. Mate, that was awesome. No, like ten minutes was just like a highball. Ten minutes was just a highball. So um I've got a question, Alex. Like just to begin, like how would you um within an anarchist state, how not an anarchist state, within an anarchist society, how would you resolve these class contradictions? Well, it depends how these class contradictions actually manifest themselves. <clears throat> so if we go back to uh, how Tom defined uh, class, I, I don't actually disagree with this definition. It's the relationship between uh, one, 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 one group of people and the means of production. So we have the owners, the bourgeoisie, and the people who just work there and don't really have uh, much access to it uh, being the proletariat. Or sorry, just don't own the, the stuff that they use being the proletariat. So where do we think that these uh, class contradictions really come from? Well. It actually comes from uh, the enforcement of absentee property. So uh, it's the enforcement of property. Now, Marxists obviously agree with us when we kind of say we need to get rid of uh, absentee property. They call it private property. I say absentee because I think absentee uh, isn't helps. It's helpful in getting to why we don't like it. It's as in, if you don't use a thing, um, then you shouldn't really own it. Uh, owning it, uh, sorry, not being able to own something you don't use has no real effect on your life materialistically. Um, so to answer the question of what, what do anarchists do about um, class conflict or, or existing class conflict after um, the anarchist uh, state exists, um, well, I actually say if there, if there is class contradictions, even if there is no state or monopoly of force, then that's not an anarchy. That you still have, um, uh, you'll still have this hierarchy, this unjustified hierarchy that exists. Uh, it's just not in the form of the state. It's you could, be, you could be describing an ANCAP society. Now, I don't really call ANCAPism an, an, an anarchist uh, society, but uh, anarchism goes further than just the state, you know? It's, it's we're, we're disagreeing with, I said, uh, political, economic, and uh, social hierarchy. So we're also thinking about uh, if there's some kind of racial hierarchy, that's not anarchism. If there's some kind of gender hierarchy, that, that's not anarchism. If there's economic hierarchy, that's not anarchism. So, um, Anarchism is only really achieved after all of these uh, hierarchies on these, these contradictions have been uh, removed. Now, I understand that um, communism can be defined as a stateless, classless, uh, currentless maybe society. Um, but uh, as I said, we have dis different def definitions of what the uh, state actually is, and we can probably go into that. Um, but that's my answer. My answer is um, it's not anarchy until those class relations are abolished. Um, now, I think you bring you brought up the external global class contradiction part as like. Uh, Is it okay if I cut you off for a sec, so I can ask? Uh, yeah, what's up? Um, I was about to say, Tom. Um, you know how this the state is such like a hierarchy and stuff. Um, even when it exists within like a socialist society, how would we go about like you know, um, like it withering away like the gradual abolition of the state because something like a state and stuff looks to preserve itself because yeah that's just the nature of power power looks to preserve itself how do we stop a state from like you know maybe not acting in the interests of the people and just act acting in its own interests uh well um the state uh for a proletarian society at least in all uh societies uh, well, prior to capitalism that we, we've understood would be conscious movements. So communists, we, uh, or marxist leninists I should say at least, um, are taking this position, uh, are taking this uh, attack to the capitalist state and uh, with the idea to produce this new state on the foundation that we understand how this Fun, this fundamentally works so as we're going into it we're not looking to keep the state we we don't like the state we understand it, i think on most fronts i i would agree with my opponent here on on um the state not being a, a good idea <laughs> to, to put it in um uh very loose terms um it's more so that we see it as a necessary tool um, in order to bring about communism being the, the stateless society. 
um, to, and, and I think um, we might have tripped over ourselves a bit um, when talking about uh, communism just then, where um, we don't think we immediately go to communism, although I, it has been described as a lower and upper phase communism. What do you mean by that, lower and upper phase? Tom, I think you've cut out. Tom, I think you've, you've cut out. If he just, if he just leaves and rejoins, and it, it, it could help yeah. him. Cool. Right. Um, so Marx described it as, as lower and higher stage communism, but fundamentally, um, what that means in practice, practice is uh, socialism being the proletarian state where there is still class contradictions that must be solved. And then once all the class contradictions are solved, of course, this isn't going to be a, a clunky, that one's done, that one's done, that one's done sort of thing. It's not going to be in units, but we will come to a point where class uh just ceases it ceases to exist and the mechanisms of class contradiction will cease and it will be a slow process as the state will wither as that contradiction itself withers as well so that that's essentially the difference there so um i was about to say alex um what what's your like, opinion on that notion of low and higher communism would you rather like have just one like in your like you know path to anarchism and communism whatever like would you rather there be like you know two stages or like you know just one blanket communism just uh, well i don't really identify myself as a communist so um if, if, to me it's going to be no no stages at all so um but in, in terms of how i get to anarchism uh, i said in my podcast i was talking in my podcast about uh, gradualism the way we um we effectively uh set up these uh well we sorry we strengthen the cooperative sector we strengthen the union movement we um uh think about way i was talking to a friend yesterday about ways in which we can um create like independent farming communities um so he's he's uh, creating manuals which help people just go out and uh, become self-sufficient with their own um their own farming so uh, things like that that kind of uh, disassociation from the state and that gradual buildup of counter hegemony which um then enables us to uh, shrug off um, the unnecessary functions of the state because now we're operating the, the influence of a state has become so minimal that we just sort of look at it and think well we don't need it anymore so if shit hits the fan then uh, we kind of think well this is just getting in the way we can we can uh, trade through cooperative enterprise we can uh, get our health care we can get our welfare through mutual aid uh, what the hell do we need the state for what the hell do we need the capitalists for um so and in terms of like um oh what was you gonna say i've lost my train of thought um, collective like um distancing yourself from the state of gradualism that's what yes uh yeah g generally just just working against state so in part in part of this process there'll be uh, i think there's a need for an organization uh which will be like an anarchist federation which will mm -hmm. uh distribute these manuals distribute some uh kind of all generally have to serve the role of organizing and helping these um, this disassociation carry out, this building up of this counter hegemony. Um, yeah. Curious the one. Um, and then, and then yeah. basically we, we just sort of overthrow the state when we want to. Mm -hmm. I suppose I'm curious because um, this has this has actually like been going on since way before Marxism, like um, the Epicurean communes like in ancient Greece, um, onto like, you know, throughout the Roman Empire, like there were like little Epicurean communes which just distanced themselves from the state, just lived among themselves. Uh, like just how come they didn't Epicurean result in, how come they didn't result in like any true change then? Yeah, because I'm not I'm not specifically referring to intentional society. We had a similar um, development in England in like the sixteen hundreds with the diggers and the levelers. Uh, mm -hmm. what they weren't trying to do is uh, replace uh, the, the established order, what they were trying to do is just go off and make their own um, little, you know, commune in the middle of nowhere sort of thing. Um, those kinds of intentional communities, I don't really have, I don't have much faith in um, really changing things in the grand scheme of things. I think um, 
when for the, for the vast majority of people, uh, the state is still going to be incredibly influential in their lives. So it is that very state they need to get rid of. Um, is is the uh, those class contradictions that Tom was talking about uh, that we need to be getting, we need to be addressing, rather than just saying, right, okay, let's go and set up our own commune in the middle of nowhere. Um, those uh, we can learn from those communes. We can certainly look at how they function, how they work, and see if we can apply them after we've gotten rid of our uh, current hegemony, hegemony, um, and then that'd be fine. But uh, I don't see a lot of revolutionary potential coming from them. Um, <clears throat> I was about to say, Tom, um, cause, like I'm not trying to label you as like just pure, just p like your position as every position of the USSR, but um, couldn't you observe this within like, you know, these contrasting ideas of like, you know, these little like, you know, communes distancing themselves from the state within like a Marxist Leninist society, couldn't you observe that thing counter revolutionary movements in the USSR and would you, Tom, argue that these move movements actually do a disservice to overthrowing capitalism in the state? I, I would, I would, I would say that um, there, there were c cases in the USSR, such as the uh, Magnavites, uh, who, in the case of the USSR, uh, whatever you may think of the USSR, the Magnavites definitely paid a very detrimental role on the development of the country in its early stages, given how they occupied mainly agricultural land and and uh, were quite well known for raiding shipments of grain that were needed heavily in the cities, given the civil war was in play. And then there was also other said situations such as um, uh, the Kronstadt uh, uprising, which again, this is another case where the uh, uh, it, it was just a heavy detriment on, on the early nations, given that Kronstadt isn't exactly where I'd imagine you'd want a commune, given that it's mainly a naval base and one of the main naval bases of the country at the time. So uh, again, it's another main detriment to, to a growing proletarian state, um, which of course, my, my opponent wouldn't uh, be particularly interested in being a proletarian, pro, uh, proletarian state. Um, but I definitely say that those are, are problematic, but I, I'm not sure I could put those in, I could put it in any way that would enamor me to my opponent or, or explain it in any way that they wouldn't disagree with, given that I'm, I, I think the proletarian state is the necessary and needed thing to happen. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how, how I could put that. Okay, so um, how would you respond to that, Alex? Because, I mean, you have a lot of love for Macno, um, I hume crunched that as well, so... How would you respond? Uh, yeah, so I think the people in uh, the Free Territory of Ukraine, uh, I don't think that they have any kind of duty to serve the USSR. Um, you say they were a part of the USSR, I don't think they were. They were part of the Russian Empire, as in they were thrown out of the Russian Empire when um, when the uh, peace, peace agreement between the Central Powers and the Russian Empire was agreed, or sorry, not the Russian Empire, but the, uh, was it the, the, the Socialist Republic, the Republic of Russia, whatever it was, between the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire. Um, that was territory ceded by um, the Russian Empire to like um, central power occupation. Um, and effectively, the, the, the failed states that emerged from that agreement um, were unable to uh, were unable to control the people in that area, and so then obviously the Magnavites uh, rebelled, and they were taking part in the Russian Revolution. I guess because it was, it took part in the, the whole territory of the Russian Empire. So we sort of say, well, well, that's all part of the Russian Revolution. It's technically the Ukrainian Civil War because um, you had different kinds of states trying to crop up in, in the Ukraine and stuff. Um, but in, yeah, I, I think I agree with your last point. There's no way you can phrase it in a way that I'll be any more. In agreement because these two ideologies, these two um, factions are completely opposed to one another. So of course they're going to see the other as like interfering with, oh sorry, uh, inhibiting their interests. Um, I mean, one reason I think, the main reason I think the Soviet Union uh, went after Ukraine was because of you know, the position of Crimea. You know, they want to get uh, access to um, the, the, the water, the, the sea, they want access to the sea um, 
a, a, a sea that's not frozen at any time of the year, you know. Um, Crimea was always like a major part of a like, Russian entrance. I bet that's why they had the Crimean War and etc. Um, yeah, so I, I'll just spin on its head and say, well, the Soviet Union's existence was um, inherently contradictory to the liberation of the working people. Um, and so therefore, I think yeah, it's justified to fight against that. Even though, um, actually, uh, there was multiple occasions where the Soviets uh, signed an, uh, 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 an alliance with, with the Magnavites, but twice they betrayed them. Uh, they just, they, they uh, invited a load of commanders in to discuss that like, strategy to take on the whites, um, but instead of actually discussing that strategy, they just slaughtered them. So, um, and then you got Trotsky, who I'm not, I'm not too sure about your position on Trotsky, Tom, but uh, Trotsky was no nicer in terms of like, treating the... Uh, the people who were protected by the Black Army. Not the Black Army themselves, but the, the peasants, the, the villagers who were protected by the Black Army. Uh, they were just massacred by uh, the Red Army. Uh, so I've got, no, I've got little love for the Soviet Union and what they did to the Ukrainians. Um, Kronstadt Rebellion, um, that's, a, that's a little bit of a different thing. I just think that's a, a bit of a mutiny. Um, some people say, well, they're kind of inspired by the anarchists, maybe. But um, I'm, I'm, I, I, need, I might need to read up on that a little bit more, but I'm not too sure if they're actually trying to establish a permanent society there because uh, as you say it was just a naval base i think it was just a mutiny and they're eventually trying to uh, give uh, the, 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 the higher command a list of demands for them to fulfill uh, but I'll, I'll need to do some more research on it okay so um as far as saying that i have one last like you know question for both of you before i let harry ask some questions so <clears throat> One thing I've seen both Marxism, Leninism, and anarchism have problems with is cult of personality. Like, you could argue that Macno had his own cult of personality. You see it all the time with Marxist, Leninist, and Asianism. So, starting with Tom, like, how would you solve this issue? Uh, well, I'd absolutely agree that uh, cult of personality is an issue, and I think uh, leaders of Marxist, Leninist countries recognize this as well. Of course, there's many. Um, laws, in fact, against it in 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 uh, the USSR, for example. Um, I remember uh, Stalin himself was definitely not happy about his cult of personality, um, although it was very instrumental and useful during the war years, um, uh, where it was used extensively in propaganda. Um, in terms of limiting it, um, it's it's a tricky thing because you have these countries that have total regime change and you have revolutionary leaders that come into these positions of power who um, are building up power within that new country by um, uh, going to the masses, leading uh, revolutionary wars, uh, of course, um, being that they're, they're not actually in power yet. These these leaders are often in the wars, so they're, they're like war heroes as well. Um, Trotsky, again, I'm, I'm, uh, to answer the, my opponent's question, I'm, I'm, I'm not a supporter of Trotsky, um, but um, I, I do recognize his positions uh, and, and achievements in the early periods of, of the development of the USSR. Um, but but these, these people are... Uh, frontline revolutionary leaders and people see that and especially when in these uh working class proletarian and and often uh peasant uh, movements these people are directly interacting with the masses and of course they build up this image so how to limit it um i, I imagine there are an, a number of things uh, um when a state is established of course you have that power you have the use of the state institutions to limit that sort of thing uh you can you have state power over uh uh press uh you'll have propaganda um uh, uh output and such um so there are ways that you could limit it as a direct strategy I, I really wouldn't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a minister in, in a, in a Marxist-Leninist country, so I, I wouldn't know what kind of strategy that would have to look like, but I imagine there would be plenty of avenues you could take to limit it. So in a way, it's kind of like, um, with deep talk Luke knows, it's kind of like, um, let's say a footballer, they don't, they don't want to build like, you know, their little cult of personality, but 
It's just built because they're so good at what they do. Is that kind of what you're saying, Tom? Um, to to an extent, it's it's the whole environment that that mm -hmm. is created when these things happen. Um, it's it's not a good thing. It, it has its uses, like I say, but it's it's not useful. It's not um, materialist. I, I I'd put it. Okay, so um. Now, before Harry asks some questions, like Alex, um, how would you deal with this problem of a cult personality within an anarchist society? Because you can see it can potentially, like, potentially become a problem, especially with you know the power vacuum that's sometimes created. Yeah, um, I don't actually disagree with anything Tom just said. Um, the cult of personality is certainly not a problem. I'm going to just pin on Marxist Leninists. It's a problem that occurs within all kinds of organisations, which are um, successful in achieving their political aims. Uh, so, how would a, so the question is how would an anarchist uh, deal with that? Well, it's going to have to go. It's, it's going to have to come down to uh, the self-regulation of that organisation. Um, it's going to have to be a, con a, a conscious awareness of the negative impact of the cult of personality. Uh, it's going to have to have a um, an awareness of its usages as well, because um, there are they are kind of useful sometimes. Um, but generally, uh, it's going to be down to um, going back to anarchists, the, the critique of authority, you know, based on the idea that it's not uh, an essential component of that organization. So we look at, um, say, let's say, uh, Matno, for example. If Matno, Matno could be a very positive influence on the, the Black Army, but if he got to a point where he's actually doing stupid things and, or immoral things, evil things, and uh, people are justifying them because they love Matno so much. Well, that's going to be unanarchistic, isn't it? It's going to be, you need to have a lot of self-regulation. You need to keep to those principles. Um, I, I think Tom will pretty much agree with that kind of strategy in his own um, movements. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I, again, like Tom, I'm not exactly um, <laughs> I'm a leader of any kind, so I can't really give you a, a detailed explanation of how I can prohibit that from happening. But um, it's, good, it's going to come from that recognition of uh, the critique of authority, um, which is, okay, you're not, you're not in charge because of your name, you're in charge because of how useful you are, you know? Brilliant, like, um, I was about to say, Harry, do you have any questions or not? I'm sure, is there any difference between, uh, Tom, like you talked about the, um, at, the end of, at the end of communism, you would arrive at a classless society. And what would be the difference between that classless society that you would arrive at through communism and the classless society of, of that the anarchist uh, envisions? Um, honestly, probably not very much. I imagine when we get to that stage, I'd agree with quite a few things that um, anarchists would say. I think this is the, the main point where uh, I, I think, like my opponent said earlier, that we would say it's a difference of how we get there. Um, I, I think it's it's hard to imagine when, when we talk about what communism will look like. It's it always does seem a bit vague and abstract. Um, partly that's because uh, it's you know it's, it's not close. We're under capitalism. We've got we believe we've got a stage to go through yet. Um, and looking at time periods of, of states that have existed before on that track, it's it's quite a ways off. So imagining that society in 100, 150, 200 years in the future is kind of difficult to put into words. But um, I, I, I imagine it would be quite similar in many ways to um, what uh, my anarchist opponent would, would say. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so w would it be fair to say that like if we imagine society as being addicted to authoritarian power structures would it be fair to say that anarchism is like going cold turkey and communism is a bit like uh, reducing the amount of authoritarianism over time to kind of inoculate people against the kind of vertigo of their own freedom uh, I'm not sure I'd quite put it like that um, I think there's a bit of a, 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 a full stick to me, or, or at least a, a, mis, a misunderstood uh, 
contradiction between when we say something's libertarian or when we say something's authoritarian. Whenever I look at examples of what this means throughout history, it tends to just mean that authoritarians do more things, if that makes sense. Um, more, more seems to happen. There's more direct involvement in doing things. So when it comes to moving people away from that gradually, I think it's 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 more. Um, there's more nuance to it than that. There's. Uh, do you have anything to say about that, Alex? Uh, what What do you think about what we've, what we've been talking about there? Uh, well, I'm actually quite surprised by um, the definition that uh, Tom gave. Um, I, know, I know he included by, um, the idea that it's a tool used for class oppression, um, but usually when I speak to Marxist Leninists, they, they reject the idea that the state is a monopoly on force altogether. You know, the, the thing that's got nothing to do with it. Um, so I thought we'd be having like a more of a debate on that, but apparently not. So that sort of um, ruffled my feathers a little, ruffled my feathers a little bit, but um, yeah, I can't, I can't really uh, read Tom's mind and tell you what he's actually thinking. So I'm just going to take that on, on board and say, well, okay, uh, do you disagree with? Um, do do you think things like uh, the bureaucracy that will be used to uh, regulate and maintain society? Do you think that those kinds of institutions will be taken away? Do you think the police force will be abolished? Do you think there'll be a polycentric legal system? Uh, do you think that there'll be um, you know, uh, room for like market competition? Do you think there'll be room for uh, self-determination of certain workplaces? So when I, I, it, it typically, I have to explain what I think anarchism would look like and see where we disagree. Um, and we probably we can do that in the uh, the free the, the free for all sort of thing. But of course, the, the free back and forth. Mm. Um, but you know, uh, I'm, so yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll we'll have a look. We'll have a look at that. What do you think about the idea that anarchism might be too dramatic a change for people? Like people are, are so used to these kind of hierarchies and structures of power that to kind of just thrust their own freedom on them would be kind of. Um, I think it's a valid point, and I think it's a, well, it's a valid point, and I think um, anarchists need to be conscious of that. Like, so um, I'm not really in favour of any kind of. Um, Back in my podcast, I was quite opposed to like a mass revolution. I was talking, I was talking about gradualism. I'm talking about a gradual um, building up of the counter hegemony, um, where we disassociate ourselves from the state and from capitalism, and we basically already have the foundations in place um, before we can actually shrug off the state. So I, I can, I agree that there's a a, um, a gradual um, resistance to the state. To say, um, I don't believe that um especially in the west i don't think there's going to be any kind of major uprising where we have a civil war and you know then half the us becomes anarchist and half the us becomes ml i don't think that's going to happen um i don't think it can happen either um so yeah i i can i because there's often uh, speak when we talk about um liberation it has to be done from um, the people who need to be liberated, you know, the people who want to liberate themselves need to do it themselves. I can't liberate you for you, you know. Um, like uh, then you do have like power vacuums, and you know, people. If if the if the resistance to the state is external, as in if um, if the US just went to Syria and just wiped out every single government official, then you'll have a real power vacuum on your hands. But if the people of Syria kind of rose up in an organized and unified manner like they did in Rojava, then you'll have a more coherent replacement for the state. And then, you know, I don't really think these, uh, I don't, I don't in that case think um, the, oh, it's all too sudden argument would apply. Um, you mentioned before Max Stirner, and he said that um, from Stirner's point of view, like the foundation of anarchism was, would be kind of like mutual self-interest. And so that we should respect each other's autonomy and cooperate with each other based on mutual self-interest. I mean, that seems to me a little bit cold, like um, not like a little bit capitalist in itself, like we're a bunch of like competitive entities who are banded together based simply on self-interest. Is that, would, would that be your position or would there be any other foundation of anarchism that you would, that you would think of? Um, I think, I think people are generally self-interested and I think it's important that they are. Um, so, Again, when it comes to that liberation, it's going to be the working class, you know, if we can call it a class, 
thinking in their own self-interest. They're not thinking of the, uh, the, the, the what benefits the states. They're not thinking about what benefits the nation. They're thinking what materially Im improves the material conditions of their well-being, of, of their lives. Um, so any kind of revolution or any kind of movement is going to have to come from self-interest. It's going to have to be... No, there's no, there's no point in me lecturing you on a society and you think, well, well, hang on, I'm, I, I can't, that doesn't benefit me at all. I'm going to be opposed to that. So um, I don't think that necessarily means competition. Uh, I think there's, because like I said, mutual self-interest. I think there's a, a lot of value to cooperation. I think there's a lot of value to mutual aid. Um, and I, I, as I say, it depends on how the people who own their workplaces and how those people who have the right to self-determination associate with the rest of the community. Uh, this is not capitalism because uh, capitalism is specifically the absentee ownership of private property, um, and that is not a mutual, a mutualistic agreement. That is a, a coercive agreement between agreement. That's a coercive um, manifestation of coercion, where uh, someone arbitrarily owns capital and pretty much controls anyone who is dependent on said capital. Uh, that's not mutualism. That's not self-interest. Um, no matter how much Iron Brown would like to tell you it is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, I, think that, I think that's my answer for mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, that, that would be it for my questions. I think, Aram, you said that you wanted to open it up for a discussion or something. Well, that's perfect. Like, that's perfect to end, like, you know, the part where we, you know, ask questions. So what I thought is um, from now on, Although it will still be moderated, it could be more of a free fall. It could be a back and forth between you two, Alex and Tom. So, I mean, I guess Tom, you have quite a few disagreements with. Like, so kick um, it off. Well, I, I do have a particular question that um, did came come up uh, with something else that was discussed on uh, this idea of gradualism. Um, how I I. Personally, I, I don't, I don't see how that could possibly be viable. So I'm, I, I'll, I'll ask you like a straight question: um, How, how could you gradually move society out of these class contradictions when society itself is being held by a state, i.e., a capitalist state, um, to maintain that particular? Uh, 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 dialectic to give it its direct term I guess um, between those classes because uh, revolution um, from from my perspective as Marxist Leninist it, it's not something we want it's not we don't want this bloody conflict we don't want this civil war but it's something we see as necessary because the state the capitalist state isn't going to just let us get away with it <laughs> to, to, to put it in, in very um uh yeah to put it that way um so I, I i don't see how this gradual change of society could possibly work because when we see uh strikes uh even well even as small as strike actions let alone moving up to more uh, rebellious actions um we see crackdowns we see police oppression um, the state will just go in there and, and gun down union leaders, as we've seen in, in multiple South American countries. So I don't see how this, I, 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 I'm struggling to see how this gradual approach to changing society could possibly succeed with that sort of state oppression uh, happening. Okay, fair enough. So my answer to that is effectively gradualism has been done before. It was done by the bourgeoisie. Um, so when the bourgeoisie accumulated their power against the monarchy, uh, it did so through numerous concessions from the monarchy to uh, a system of deregulation to the point where they had the Inclusions Act, and then, they, then it became the bourgeoisie who were effectively uh, running society, and the feudal uh, overclass were just sort of getting in the way of those um, of that management. So. That's but, but, but the reason I go to gradualism is because that's literally how the bourgeoisie did it. Um, so in terms of like uh, unions being gunned down and uh, rebellions being crushed, etc., that's precisely my point. Um, any kind of violent resistance to the state is going to be crushed immediately. However, peaceful and voluntary uh, setting up, peaceful and voluntary means like um, expanding the cooperative sector, for example, um, you're going to find it very, very difficult for uh, the state to justify 
going into a cooperative and just looting everything and shutting the thing down. Um, it happens sometimes, I, I, I certainly agree. Um, but it's what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm generally referring to a uh, building up of counter economics, counter hegemony. Um, so through expanding the union movement, through expanding the cooperative sector, through expanding uh, and improving uh, mutual aid networks, so that the, um, the foundations for this anarchist or proletarian society are already in place, it already fun it's already functioning, basically. This new economy is already there. It's just being inhibited now by uh, the bourgeoisie, who are, we are becoming less and less dependent on uh, to live for. So when, um, so one, one, one example is like the police force. Before, uh, the monarchy was very much responsible for protecting people. Uh, it was very much uh, responsible for having um, the, 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 arms, the, arm, the armed soldiers, the, the, the knights and all the rest of it, and they were basically acting as some kind of police. But when uh, a lot of devolution happened to the point where uh, property, private property was literally uh, conceived, uh, and this was done without revolutionary means, by the way, um, there, was a, there, there were private entities set up to defend that property, and this became the police. Um, and so now we have the police force, you know? Um, Great Britain is a, is a perfect example of the bourgeoisie taking control of the country uh, without actually having a bloody revolution overthrowing the monarchy. The, the, the Queen still exists, but she has little to no influence. Um, so that, I think that's genuinely my answer. If you've got any specific questions on that, I can see if I can answer them. Um. I'm struggling to think of examples where th these examples where the bourgeoisie have done that. Um, and I'm struggling to think of what those are. Um, I mean, when, when the US separated um, and became its own, uh, well, not, not exactly uh, capitalist as we would understand it today, but um, when that separated from the crown, there was a war. Um, the way we got a parliament, there, there was a war. Uh, the French, uh, Napoleon, that there, there was another uh, what we would call a bourgeois revolution. I'm, 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 I'm not sure what these examples are of when uh, th this was achieved with the bourgeoisie. If you could, could well, you uh, elaborate on some of those? Yeah, but, but like I said, I said a second ago, the example of the UK. Um, there was no. I mean, you can say there was a war for the uh, the parliament, but before that war, you needed to have. Um, a class, i.e., the bourgeoisie, who had the capacity to do, to um, really challenge the the monarchy, um, the barons, and so the, the, the barons alliance that revolted against uh, what was it called, uh, King John, and had the Magna Carta and all the rest of it. These people needed. I'm not. I'm not saying, by the way, there's no, there's, there's no uh, point where there's going to be any kind of revolution. I don't think um, gradualism alone is going to. We're slowly going to destroy the state through. Through trading in cooperatives, that's not what I'm. I'm that's not what I'm proposing. Um, I'm saying that we need to have a significant counter hegemony uh, that is going to be able to really challenge the bourgeoisie when shit hits the fan. And what I mean by shit hits the fan, I'm talking about um, the results of climate change and the results of um, maybe even coronavirus, possibly maybe. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the 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 creation of the police was another example. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure uh, why. Even even things like uh, the, uh, America, um, they still they basically had capitalism in existence underneath uh, the, the colonial monarchy. All they had to do was get rid of that colonial uh, influence. Um, the reason they couldn't do it before is because they were so dependent on uh, the crown for support and assistance and like you know, getting the, getting the resources abroad and getting the the uh, intellectual stuff aboard. Um, so you do need to have that kind of build-up of counter hegemony before you can actually do anything with it. Right, okay. I, I, I think I'm understanding a bit better that it isn't a an end-to-end -end process, that, it, that you don't think um, gradualism gets you all the way to... No, no, of course not. Right, I, okay. I, und I understand that a bit better now. Yeah. So you're... The problem, I think, right now. So the reason the reason I go to this is because I was watching. Are you familiar with Borsch? Um, oh, oh too too familiar, I would say. Yeah, fair enough. I, I can I can I know exactly why uh, I think Amal Tlenes wouldn't like him. I don't particularly like him either. Um, so <laughs> the, what his solution is basically to um, create a um, 
a faction within the Democratic Party which is favourable to socialism and then have that grow out and when shit hits the fan, we'll have anarchism. Okay, what, what the hell? My problem with that is um, if you have people who are... If you, if you um, build the... Uh, if you manage uh, the... I'm losing my words. If you... If... I'm trying to think of the word. If you set, if you facilitate the functions of society through the state, and you have that become a the general norm, then I think people are not going to really be that favorable to favorable to anarchism um, or anything like it. I think all you're going to do when shit hits the fan is have a a, a reactionary uh, resistance to reinforce what's already existing. If you have counter hegemony, then the people, as in the proletariat, who benefit from that counter hegemony are going to be um, proposing their own system as a replacement, not more of the old, you know? Um, so I think it's fundamentally needed before, um, as I say, shit hits the fan. Right. Um, I, that doesn't seem actually too different than um, um, some uh, Marxist theories, um, uh, especially um, like the Maoist mass line. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not a Maoist, so I wouldn't try and, and go into that. But um, uh, honestly, it's it's not that doesn't actually sound too different than our position. Again, I think I think um, our disagreement would come down to what we then do with that countering force. Yeah. So what we do with that countering force is dismantle the state, and we dismantle, uh, we, we abolish absentee property, and we dismantle the monopoly of force. What would you like to do with it? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'd, I'd agree, but I think, um, again, the methods would be different, um, that we would want to be seizing state power to then use state power to to um, protect that, that new society that we've built and protect the interests of that society in um, dismantling the class contradiction, not only in that country once it's stable, but then exporting the revolution. I don't understand this position because I hear it from uh, Marxist Leninists a lot when they're critiquing anarchism. They kind of say, "Well, um, how can an how can an anarchist society defend itself without a state?" Well, I'm 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 quite confused why you ask well, why they ask that question because if they have faith in um, the proletariat overthrowing their own state, the state that hangs over them, then that, which is the more difficult task, by the way. I don't understand why uh, you necessarily need the state or the monopoly of force to defend that. I don't see that as a... All you need, to, all you need is um, resources. You need to have um, well-armed personnel. You need to have intelligence. You need to have blah, 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 to have that protection. You just need to have the capital, you know? Hmm. I, I think the... When it comes to that issue, I, I find the main problem I have with it is it. When does that level of organisation? When when does that kind of I, I guess power? And I, 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 I'm I'm trying not to directly um, get to my point here without um, explaining it. Um, when does that power? Um, get too close to being a, a, a state there's a, a an, an, an issue that we we come across quite quite a lot of the time is, uh or, or through through history I, we we see uh such as um in spain for example especially is when that sort of organizational power and and power over people um to uh, enact that sort of defense that when when Oh, I'm, I'm struggling to word this, to be honest. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? <laughs> it, it uh, I, I, I just have to put it how, how we see it. We, we see, um, such as those uh, uh, in the Spanish Civil War and in situations where um, anarchist groups have had to defend themselves, um, have become what we would call states. 
and I wonder why they are not from your perspective. And, and I'm struggling to put that in any better way. I, there, there must be better ways to word that, but yeah. Um, I think the CNT are a poor example because uh, don't forget the CNT was a union and therefore it wasn't just anarchists in the union. It was also like socialists of all forms in that union. Even moderates, even like liberals were involved in that um, union. Not not liberals as in capitalists, as in like the people who are just moderately in favour of mm. uh, the Republicans, you know. Um, so the the CNT wasn't an exclusively anarchist union. It was um, quite a diverse. There's quite a diverse range of views within that, um, and some of whom were like Marxist Leninist, and some were quite happy to have things that even I would call a state um, in place. Um, and we even had the FAI, FAI uh, set up to try and bring the CNT back to its uh, its original roots, its anarchistic roots, which was a, a, a bit of a mess, let's be honest. Um, so, I, but I wouldn't I wouldn't call the um, the free territory of Ukraine a state. I think the, that army there was not a monopoly of force; it was a voluntary army. Uh, it did not rely on conscription. It didn't. Uh, it was it's, it's also democratic internally. And it didn't really impose any real authority on uh, the, the places that it, it liberates. It imposed levies on some areas and some cities, but that was mainly coming from the ruling class that was fighting against them. Um, but it wasn't a monopoly on force, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't class it as a state. So uh, when you say, oh, when does that become too much like a state? I said, well, okay, when they're, co when they're coercing uh, people, when they're violating people's rights to... Um, peaceful people's rights to life, uh, autonomy, use for property, when they're imposing, when they're trying to gain support through imposition, not persuasion, uh, and when they're just basically asserting that they have um, a monopoly on force over a given territory, that is when I kind of say, well, yeah, you're not really an anarchist anymore. You're, you're being anti-anarchistic. Right, and I'm, I'm guessing you would say that... Um that wouldn't come before the point uh, that the amount of force would exist that would be needed to defend them. Um, well, it depends what you mean by the amount of force. Do you mean the concentration or the, or the centralization of force? Or do you mean uh, just the general manpower? Well, I, I'm, I mean, it's... It's kind of hard to describe because in most cases, the state in which these societies, these anarchist groups would be set up would definitely have the the forces, the, the armaments, the men and the equipment to take back those spaces. So how much is too much when it comes to defending these places? I don't think there's a, a certain number of, I'm not going to give you a number of um, soldiers, I think should be the maximum. But what I will say is, you know, we look at what anarchism is, we go back to the critique of authority, um, we think about whether or not the force is being coercive or totalitary, um, we make sure that they're defending the, uh, not, not defending, well, defending and respecting the, the liberty and the autonomy of the people within those communities, um, and they make sure that their, their own support is completely voluntary. Um, so I'm not. I'm not too sure. I'm, I don't. I don't really understand the question. Um, Sorry. I. I, 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 I guess. I, um. I. I could clarify. Uh, it's. Okay. It's. It's just really difficult for me to. To. Um. Word because from my perspective, it seems like it's. It's. Um. It's doomed. It seems like it. Um. Such projects would be doomed from the start, given the, the situation they're in. It's like. Um. Um, I, I, I guess it's like you're trying to defend an egg from being crushed in a crusher with your hands, and it's just like you're, you're just going to get your hands crushed and the egg's going to be crushed, and it's going to be a mess. Um, well, if we, again, if we go back to the free territory of Ukraine, I think even if they were, even if they were a fascist state um, with an incredibly militaristic culture defending themselves against the USSR, um, I think the USSR would have completely overthrown them. I think if... Um, if you swap, if you swap those two countries around, if the USSR was the uh, anarchist uh, territory and Ukraine was the Soviet, the Soviets, then I struggle to see how the Soviets would be able to like overthrow the anarchists or uh, overrun the anarchists due to the capital and the manpower that existed in Russia at the time. So uh, when you say it's, it's doomed from the start, it's really dependent on. Um, 
it, to me, to say it's doomed from the start really implies some inherent um, internal problems with anarchism. And really, when we see anarchist uh, societies go away, it's usually due to external pressures, like it, it, like in the Paris Commune, that was from the, the Prussians and the French basically breaking back into Paris. Uh, if you look at um, the uh, obviously the free territory Ukraine was done by Russia, uh, Christania and the Chaz movement were, were, were crumbling to, um, well, not crumbling, but like, um, well, Chaz caved in, but that was because they didn't really try and plan for the long term. But like, Christiania is just succumbing to external government pressure. Uh, but even if Christiania was like an ML society, I don't really understand why. I don't really see how they'd be able to resist the rest of the, the Danish state, you know. Um, it's dependent on, again, it, the, to be able to defend a territory requires manpower, resources, vehicles, uh, the, gen the general uh, stuff that you need to defend things. I don't think that needs to be uh, uh, accumulated into a monopoly of force. Okay, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to jump in, but um, cause I have like, a question which may, you know, relate to this part of the discussion. Like, could you not argue that um, the way anarchism is um, that fundamental opposition to, you know, monopolies on force mean may mean that they are inherently disorganized because like such organization that will prevent a lot of these like, you know, anarchist communes from collapsing is it isn't. Like a very anarchist attitude. Could you not argue that, like that, you know, <clears throat> due to the inherent nature of anarchism, these societies may collapse due to lack of organisation? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think you can. I think you can organise on voluntary, and um, you can organise on, on voluntary grounds. You don't need to be coerced into. Um, you don't need to be coerced into like supporting a certain goal. Um, all you need to do is be convince enough people that uh, this, this 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 society needs to be defended, and this, this is how we do it. But um, yeah, like again, if, if as I said before, if, if, even if Ukraine was a fascist state, it wouldn't have survived the onslaught of the Soviets, you know. Um, so I'm really not too sure where, because as I said before, these, these societies don't cr they don't crumble internally. Um, there's no Problem. It, there's no internal problem with them. They they, they, they are able to organise themselves on voluntary bases. But um, like question for Tom, uh, if the Soviet Union didn't invade um, Ukraine, do you think? And, and at, that, at that point, they, they basically won out against the, the whites in the area. They won out against the um, the foreign interventionists from like Austria-Hungary and, and Germany. Uh, do you think that that would have been just become uh, sub, 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 subject to um, internal problems? Do you think that would have collapsed internally? Uh, sorry, I, th I think I missed the first part of that question. Oh, sorry. So um, do you think that if, if the Soviet Union didn't invade Ukraine uh, with all this manpower, do you think that uh, Ukraine was then doomed to fail as an anarchist society? Uh, sure. I, 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 I think um, it would not have just been um, the USSR that would have been had interests in that area, but I think it would definitely have been seen as a power vacuum by other um, European countries that would definitely have had interests in the area. Um, and I don't think... Uh, it, it doesn't seem like it's an organisation of society that... Um, could it just doesn't it doesn't compute for me how it could exist in that area well i mean it, we, we can we can look at the uh, types of organizations that i'm proposing will um carry out the necessary functions of that society so for one it's cooperatives uh, we know that cooperatives work pretty well um they work better i think that than uh, capitalist institutions um, the only reason we haven't really got a grip on today's economy is because there's a lot of government regulations that stop that from being the case. Um, but like, I, I, I have I have a, quite a big problem with the, the idea that uh, we judge um, the we judge the um, validity of a, of a of a type of society based on um, its capacity to deal with external pressures. Um, so if so let's and, and okay, 
the example I'm going to give to you is uh, the UK, good old England back in like the 1600s, 1500s, maybe a bit before that. If the uh, UK did not uh, accumulate an empire, uh, it would have been very, very subject to uh, the other colonial powers. Would you therefore say colonialism is justified or necessary for um, the UK to function and therefore uh, any resistance to colonialism is completely unjustified because you think it's doomed to it's doomed from the start. Uh, I, I'm 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 not really sure what you're asking there because it seems that colonialism wins either way, whether we do it or someone else does it. Yeah, colonialism will probably win, but would you say that any resistance to colonialism is unjustified because? Uh, you need to have a colonial empire in order to compete with the other colonial empires or the other unjust states. You know? I, I'm, I'm getting confused because you're bringing justification into it. And um, I, I, I have not really said anything about whether anything's justified or not. Um, it, 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 there's a common um, thing that people often, I, I don't know whether this is where you're, you're getting this from or, or whether this is just me uh, um, inferring it, but um, a, co a common thing with uh, Marxism is people say, "Oh, it's about the morals; it's the moral position, etc." But Marxism is, in fact, not a moralist position whatsoever. It's um, through uh, dialectical materialism we just see this as a as the progression of society. It's a natural dialectical progression. So, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure yeah, where. Want. You're not nihilist, though, are you? Yeah, wait. Um... I, I, I am a nihilist, but not, not all communists are. Um, I think that's an inherently contradictory position. In what way? Uh, I don't understand why you'd be um, in favour of the proletarian revolution if you're a nihilist, if you don't think it matters. Well, I, I, uh, my, my position as a nihilist is I don't think anything objectively matters. Um, when it comes to nihilism and just saying nothing matters, obviously that's not correct because interpersonally there are things that matter to us, uh, provably, um, or, or objectively, provably. There, 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 there are things that are that matter to individuals, things that matter in systems, etc. But nothing uh, objectively matters. Okay, I'm, I'm slightly confused now. Um, I, that sounds more like existentialism than nihilism. Ni nihilism is the belief that nothing matters. Existentialism can sort of say, well, okay, nothing objectively is inherently valuable, but you make your own value. That's, that's my position, by the way. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that seems pretty similar. My, my understanding of, um, of nihilism is that it, there, there are different fields it can exist in, um, my my field that I, I understand it to be in is in the field of objectivity. Right. Um, so I, 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 I'm well, not I'm not really sure the relevance or, or where we've gone though. Oh, because I'm just understanding. I'm just trying to understand why you're siding with the uh, the Soviet Union in terms of look uh, at it's kind of, in the war it had with uh, Magnovia. I'm just trying to understand why you're taking that position. If it's just oh because they'll win then why didn't you take the side of the US? Because it won. The Cold War. I don't see that anyone particularly won the Cold War. No, the US won the Cold War because the Soviet Union collapsed. The Soviet Union collapsed, but I can't really see that that's a victory to the US in the Cold War. These, for me, these are two separate events. The, uh, for, for me, my, my perspective on the collapse of the USSR is that this was uh, an internal problem that the USSR uh, had from an early stage um, where uh, elements, revisionist elements within the USSR, such as uh, Khrushchev, um, where they introduced, uh, reintroduced um, uh, policies and and uh, uh, laws that allowed for the return of capitalism, such as the Lieberman and Kosygin reforms, which reintroduced profit as a primary um, uh, uh, aspect for judging um, uh, state enterprises and reintroducing rights and, and controls for managers of these state enterprises, and etc. 
I think these are the main underlying issues that resulted in um, the collapse of the USSR. I don't think it's anything external that the US was able to do. Well, I, I, I think well, we're going away from the topic, but I, I disagree. I think the, uh, the US played a massive role in um, uh, accelerating the collapse of the USSR in terms of like it's obviously the espionage and the, and the, and what, the imperialism, etc. Like that, and things like that. But um, no, I think, okay, so my position on like why things are justified, to bring it back to the topic, um, if we go back to what I was saying about uh, Max Stirner and how people do things in their own self-interest, um, you've really, and how, how anarchism comes along with that, uh, you've really got to think about um, the material, oops, sorry, the material needs of, uh, and the material interests of the people who get things done, so i.e. the working class. Um, the reason I'm opposed to capitalism is because uh, I don't think capitalists serve any fundamental role in uh, production, because we know that workers can do it anyway. Um, so when we have um, autonomous communities uh, trying to resist um, external uh, pressure, including the Soviet Union, I think they're completely, I don't think they have a reason not to do so. Um, and what you usually find with, maybe not yourself in this case, which again, the nihilism aspect surprised me a lot. Um, what you usually find from MLs is they, they'll be condemning uh, the anarchists as being like counter-revolutionary, they're, they're being uh, too selfish, they're, being, they're not, they're not um, really interested in, in our goals, uh, so therefore we are, we are justified in over, overrunning them. Um, but I think, okay, the, 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 the people living in the Ukraine don't have any kind of duty to help the Soviet Union. Uh, they only have some kind of in, in, uh, some kind of affinity to help themselves and create their own um, self-sufficient economy, as they kind of did. You know, they, they had different kinds of setups across the Ukraine. They had the um, they had in some areas they had the, the communistic uh, the communes, and in some areas they had cooperatives. Um, it was actually pretty self-sufficient. Um, and there was no internal issues there. There was just there was just the external pressures, as I say. But um, I'm re I, again, I'm, I'm quite confused by um, the idea that we look at these things and we, and we look at different societies and judge them by um, their ability to um, withstand the pressures of the external pressures. Because then we have, we're effectively just justifying extreme um, authoritarianism, aren't we? Um, and okay, maybe. That's comfortable for a nihilist, maybe, uh, but it's not to me. As someone who's self-interested, I don't think it's my in my self-interest to be uh, underneath a, a totalitarian state. Um, so I, I, I just don't understand the fact why, why we're having. I, I just don't understand. I just don't understand why we're, where, I, I where this is coming. Cut you off there, Alex. Can I cut you off? Because like, I think Tom needs yeah, think. Tom, Tom should have some time to respond to that because he said a lot. He said quite a bit, like. Yeah, well, I I think um, our, our angles on 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 the overall on, on the broad strokes are actually quite similar. I mean, I'm I'm against capitalism for uh, I suspect it's pretty similar reasons. I mean, it, I I think it's a very inefficient system. I think it causes a lot of suffering, and I think um, the whole uh, the the class dialectic, the class contradiction continuing is a, a, a main source of that continuing suffering. So when I look at the solutions to this, when I think about how to end this, these problems, these inefficiencies, this suffering, um, I'm looking at a long-term picture of how to do that. I'm not necessarily looking at how to do that immediately for the people around me, because we can have little nice things all the time. We can give people social democracy. We can make um, little... Uh, aspects of capitalism easier and nicer for people as much as we want but it's not going to end the suffering it's not going to stop the continuous system of history crushing people as it rolls along um, so when i'm looking at my solutions to it i'm thinking about what ends it what stops the wheel of of history crushing people what stops all of this what brings about a system which can be better and for me, um, bringing about socialism and then communism, th this is the path um, that I see that achieves that. Um, 
um, my, my nihilist position really only comes into effect um, on a personal basis. It's, it's, uh, it's not, doesn't really affect me too much in my day-to-day -day life or really my, my, my uh, political beliefs too much because uh, for me, um, it's, this is just a, a matter of, of natural societal progression. It's not, it's not a matter of whether I want it or not. I believe it's going to happen whether I want it or anyone wants it, whether or not, unless we blow ourselves up, up in a nuclear war or whether um, uh, climate change kills us all first. If precluding those two things, I think it's going to happen just because that's the natural progression of, of dialectics. Um, and, and, and so when it comes to uh, justifying or wanting things, like um, it doesn't really come into the picture because I, I, I just think it's happening. I, it, it's, it's a progression, it's a natural progression for me. It's, it's, well, and it's, it's, a, it's a natural progression that I understand um, given the basis of uh, what, what we see throughout history, it's, it's um, seeing the, the trajectory of the projectile and seeing where it's going to land is, is how I'd put it. Okay, so my disagreement with that would be um, the di disinteresting yourself from the movement that you're dedicating yourself to. So what I mean by that is you're not actually thinking in terms of yourself or the people around you, you're thinking of uh, the long-term end goal of humanity. Um, that doesn't sit well with me because, again, I don't really think I need to be um, stripping myself of all freedom, and, freedom and, and of autonomy just for the sake of uh, humanity as it may be a few hundred years down the line. I don't really think anarchism is specifically antithetical to that, but um, my priority is myself. Like, it's, it's egoism. Um, and this is, why, this is why I don't understand with, the, again, you're trying to marry this dedication to um, the utopia of humanity with nihilism. Like, okay, it doesn't matter, but we're going to risk no, and revolution is a, you're talking about revolution. Revolution is a, a very, very risky process. You're uh, risking a lot of um, reactionary forces. You're, you're risking uh, the whole thing going wrong, uh, the whole thing turning into like another Soviet Union. Um, you're putting a lot on the line here. You're, putting a lot, and you're dedicating a lot of your efforts now um, when you're in, in, the, in the end you just sort of admit it doesn't matter so I don't I, I really don't understand where this is coming from or where, where this incentive to um, uh, serve the rest of the rest of the human future I suppose is coming from I don't I just don't understand it I don't they're just two opposing uh, they're just two opposing um, ideas well, it's um communism isn't the only thing it's not like um there's uh, only one great thing in this process we i think socialism is a brilliant thing as well and i think socialism is something that's definitely achievable in our lifetime perhaps not in this country but for some people in the world i mean there are revolutions being fought right now uh for example the philippines um that the, i i think uh, socialism brings about a uh, massive change a massive uh, um, amounts of social and uh, economic uh, improvements to people's lives. I think that does a great deal at helping to alleviate the suffering um, that uh, is happening under capitalist society. So it's it's not just that I'm that we're we're shooting for the moon and everything's kind of crap and we're we're just wading through the crap until we get to this good thing. I think there are plenty. There's plenty of good to be had along the way towards that objective, but it's we we've got the two sides to it. We've got to bat. We 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 don't um, have the immediate uh, um, gratification of uh, uh, not the word, but that there isn't. Um, there might not be an an, an immediate. Uh, uh, of, uh, victory to be had anywhere, but I think that's just how things are. I don't think that there's that there is a victory to be had immediately. Um, that will be our end goal. Um, I think there's, there's going to be a long, protracted process to get to that point where we, where um, the class contradiction, all of that is solved. Um, 
and, and I, again, um, the, my nihilism really doesn't come into this too much because my position uh, with nihilism is is more of a personal um, aspect. I, um, of course, I, I still have wants. I still have personal desires, uh, uh, personal. I, I, I want socialism for myself, my, uh, my family, uh, my, my fellow um, uh, proletarians around the world, because I, of course, um, the working classes have much more in common with each other than they uh, around the world than they do to uh, those of uh, other classes in there or, or the of the um, ruling class of their own country. So there's people just like me in other countries that I'm I'm wishing for this victory for and wishing for socialism for because I know that that's going that that will help them in so many ways. So uh, I, that that I uh, hopefully that kind of clarifies a bit more where I'm at. Um, so if we can just go into what you mean by uh, socialism, I, I suppose you're talking about like socialism as a transition to communism. Um, I'm going to ask, ask what, what kind of, what does that look like? Does that just mean when the government does stuff or does it mean, because um, I, I define my position as socialist as well. Like, I, I would call a anarchist community where you have different kinds of uh, organizations where the workers effectively control the means of production. I, I call that socialism. Um, even if it's market socialism, even if it's like anarcho communism, it's all it's all socialism. Um, so I'm going to have to ask, uh, what's this socialism more like? Well, fun fundamentally, it is um, proletarian ownership over the means of production. Um, but again, the element where I I think there will need to be a state to to defend that socialism and eventually export it um, and to organize it, um, would be, um, a, a proletarian state and more specifically a dictatorship of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie, um, yep. as, as they would still exist. Um, but fundamentally that, 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 that's, that's it. So do you believe in the idea of a vanguard party? Uh, I do. Yes. Okay. So if I say one party state, what do you think? Uh, again, again, I I, I would um, say that I think that's a good thing. And and to clarify, given that this is a podcast, not just a general discussion, I think I should explain that a bit more. Um, when people hear one party state, given that we live mostly in countries where we have multi-party bourgeois democracies, that seems like a scary thing because it's like, oh, you can only choose one party. But um, our idea for this one party state is that uh, democracy within that party is democracy as we would understand it today you'd have um representatives around the country from a bottom-up perspective so starting in workplaces and moving up into regional areas etc so you would have more perhaps more democracy more choice more more um representation than you have currently under um uh bourgeois democracy um and another principle which is uh, commonly um, uh, used within uh, Marx Leninist framework for this is um, that there would be uh, instant recallability for any representatives. Um, so instead of there being set terms where you can't get rid of a shitty government for, for four years, um, any representative, anyone you don't feel is representing you is recallable. Okay, so um, obviously this is. Um... If well, the role of a state is to pin down the bourgeoisie, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to need a lot of regulations on who can be a part of that process. If you can't pin down the bourgeoisie whilst allowing anyone and any anyone to take part in this uh, one party, uh, you're going to need to have a little bit. And also, uh, the media play a massive role in democracy. You're going to have to have some kind of uh, government control on who can who can say what in the media. Um, so of course, yeah, of of course. Um, um, given given that the the state is set up in such a way that we have this bottom up representation of of the working classes from their workplaces right to the top, then we can build a state where we can give control of all the state apparatus to the working people. In such, we we could regulate such things as that. Would you would you call it bottom up though? Because you're going to have to, you're going to have to have people at the top. Deciding who and who isn't uh, viable, uh, but not viable. Uh, who who and who isn't a legitimate uh, member of this party? 
uh, who, who can take part in this um, one party democracy sort of thing. And sure, also, but even these people at the top will be beholden to all those who have uh, elected them to those positions. Do you not see a contradiction there? Uh, no, given that you don't actually have to be a party member to elect these people, it'd be you'd be um, it's democracy as we understand it today. You don't have to be um, any particular person in society to vote. You just vote because you're a member of of that. You're part of that country. Wait, so, so hang on. If you, if you work them? in a workplace, then you will have a representative in that workplace. And of course, there will be um, uh, communal workplaces. Uh, all, all places will be uh, owned socially by uh, those people who work there. Can, can that workplace uh, say, OK, actually, we don't want this guy here. Uh, we want to have a cooperative and, you know, not do as the state tells us, not do what they're doing, not do what Moscow tells us to do. We want to do what we want to do. Is that compatible with one party democracy? Or? I, I mean, I, I don't really see the contradiction there because if, if those people are still acting in the interests of those people, of, of the people of, of, the, of that state, then I don't see the issue there. Okay. Um, so, well, the contradiction I was pointing out before was um, well, so if non party um, members are allowed to vote, in, so hang on, how, how are these candidates elected? Are they, is, it, is it like in the Soviet Union where it was just like a one candidate thing and they had some kind of um, vote to say how, how much they were approved? Or is it like several candidates from the same party kind of? Who, who selects these candidates as well? Right. I'm, I'm not too sure how this is bottom up. Well, it, it begins in places of work, so it, it it's it's not uh, it doesn't begin on the regional level like it does for us. It begins uh, within a factory or within a collective farm or within a particular working uh, space, and then someone will represent that working space. Um, and then you'll start moving up levels. And the people who work collectively in those working places, which will be everyone, by the way, um, the, the, um, there, there wouldn't really be a, a hole anywhere in, in who could be working because there's always work to be done. Uh, where we see unemployment in, in capitalist countries, that isn't done because there isn't any work. Um, that's, that's because it's not profitable for them to be working. But um, in these situations, there would everyone would be able to have a representative of their particular workplace, and then that would be integrated into the system. Uh, that sounds incredibly bureaucratic, doesn't it? Um, per perhaps you could say that, but it would be represented. Okay, so if it's bureaucratic, then it's not really bottom up, is it? I, I, you'd have to explain what you mean by bureaucratic. Well, because if you've got layers of bureaucracy, as in all these representatives are answering to another guy and then they're answering to another guy and, answering, and you work your way up, then it's not how it's not bottom up because there's no direct, there's no direct democracy going on. It's, it's, it's representative democracy with another representative with another representative with another representative. It's you're still just selecting you know, the, the, the lesser of two evils, I imagine, um, between what's presented to you by the party. Because the, I imagine the party select the candidates who can be in what, what workplace or you know, whatever. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't see how they would be selecting candidates, and I'm not really sure uh, your point. Well, okay, so. The representative needs to be of this party, doesn't they, mate? Uh, they, they need to be a worker or they need to be in some place. They need to work in that particular workplace. Yeah, but, then, but to they, be a they, representative... They can't, they can't, they can't just be thing. sitting outside it. They can't just be like... Uh, they, they, there's no assigned uh, political commissar for a particular workplace. There is a worker of that workplace. Right, but he can't have, they can't have their own like political interests and unify with other 
similarly minded um, representatives who say, well, we don't quite like uh, Stalinism. We'll just have our Trotskyist party instead. So that can't happen. Oh, I mean, that certainly wouldn't happen given that uh, Trotsky was seen as a terrorist. Um, yeah, if I'm, we're talking I'm, about I'm, that I'm, point. I'm talking about hypotheticals. I'm, I'm like, we like we like the ideas of candidate A. Oh, sorry, um, ideology A and ideology B. These are two opposing uh, communist uh, ideologies. Right, it doesn't matter what they are. So one is in line with the party line. And the other is opposed to it. Like it's, it's critical of what the party's doing. Um, so, can the workers set up their own party to, uh, let's say, um, hold the feet, at least hold the, uh, the, 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 the the ruling party's feet to the fire, or can run against it? Can, can they do that? Uh, certainly. Um, the, 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 this is, um, in fact, um, an interesting process which. Uh, 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 using example of the uh, USSR, I can explain um, uh, that uh, criticism and self-criticism is is two uh, aspects of communism, which are pretty pretty widely distributed uh, to to a lesser extent formally in USSR, but especially under in in China. I know Mao wrote about them extensively, but th there is a, a process for criticism and self uh, criticism. Which is very integral to how um, Marxist-Leninist countries have, have worked, um, and through that, there are there, there's um, there, there have been hiccups uh, uh, historically, um, particularly uh, during uh, Trotsky and and that, um, and through this, uh, there was developed uh, democratic centralism. And now, essentially, what democratic centralism means is when you come to an issue, the issue is debated and criticized and uh, gone over at, com at length um, uh, as much as possible to work out all of its issues. And then once you've completely uh, covered it thoroughly, um, you come to a decision on it. And once that decision has been made, unless there is a fundamental um, need to reassess that particular issue, it is held by the party and everyone onwards from there. And breaking from that is factionalism. Um, now, this is done because um, when uh, these issues have been brought up before, uh, a, a potential hole in, in the situation is if there's a particular issue that you're not happy about the result of, you could bring it up again and again and again and again, and you start building a group around that, around an issue which has already been fully assessed and, and decided upon. Um, you, you end up just building a group for the sake of building a group. You end up building that faction, not because uh, it's in the interests of actually making that change or, or because... Um, that's a fundamental change that needs to be made, but because it's it's a separation, it's it's separation for the sake of separation, and that's why that was brought about. Okay, um, I was about to say like this is such a wonderful discussion. We could talk about this like forever, but I think now will be, and we could even maybe even have a part two. But I think now I think we should like go for maybe five minutes more. Um, so if anyone has like any closing statements, then um, okay. Right. I, could give my, I, could give my, I could give my closing statement if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my closing statement would generally be along the lines. I'll be, I'll be carrying on from um, what has just been said. Um, my problem with the, 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 the system that you described, um, one, the most fundamental one would be uh, the idea of that democratic centralism, let's say. Um, with that, you're going to include um, a large number of people. Uh, so the more people who are taking part in this democratic centralism, and I guess this is decentralized, the less power those workplaces or people in those workplaces have over the things, have over this, uh, uh, this government. So the more people uh, who are taking part in this democracy, the less significance my vote has, the less of a say I have on, uh, the less of a say I have on the things that, that concern me, surrounding me. Um, anarchism answers this by 
decentralizing authority to the point where there's literally no monopoly of force. So uh, again, you, you, the, demo, the, the workers democratically control their workplace directly rather than trying to get their representative into power. And hopefully they'll negotiate with the other representatives to convince the higher ups, to convince the higher ups then to get the stuff that they want into, into power and into practice. Um, I think that there is no, absolutely no uh, responsibility or obligation for workers to support the wider state. I think the state is just an immaterial, insubjective concept, which um, is out the scrutiny of uh, individuals uh, and, then, and whether or not that state uh, actually benefits a self-interest, I don't think it does. I think the state is an organization which is separate from an individual, but a group of individuals on its own. Um, to the point where really I don't understand, I, I'd seen no, I still see no justification for the state um, as a monopoly force which coerces everyone within it to support its existence. We didn't really go into like, um, we didn't really go into that kind of critique of it, but um, that's kind of where we'd probably go from, um, start going for, off from uh, if we're going to debate this again. Um, so yeah, I think I'm pretty much done there. Um, take it away. Uh, well, I, I, I think from our two positions, we, I, I, I think we agreed fundamentally on, on, on quite a lot, um, which I, I, was, I was somewhat expecting. Um, but I think I, there were also quite a few interesting issues that uh, came up, this idea of gradualism and how we found that that was actually something that perhaps we have in common, although perhaps under different names and different strategies and what we wanted to do with it. So I think that was quite interesting. Um, but I, 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 I wish we really could have got into more the class contradictions and the uh, what, what I understand to be the um, fundamental class origins of, of the state and, and why I think that, that necessitates it through these different stages of society. I think that would have been a very interesting topic to have discussed. Um, but... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I think um, uh, as much as uh, Marx, Lenin, and uh, anarchists seem to butt heads quite a lot, I think we we managed to agree on quite a few things, and I think hopefully um, I, I, uh, things have been explained that makes things more understandable. Uh, I, things you, you've said, I, I understand a lot better now. Um, so yeah, I, I think we definitely succeeded on on the. Uh, premise of building a dialogue and understanding things a bit better. I mean, thank you two so much for being on the podcast. Honestly, this has been an absolutely brilliant discussion. Like, considering how this one went, um, I just can't wait to have more of these discussions. Like, honestly, you two just killed it. So um, everyone, thank you to um, Alex. Thank you to Tom. And peace out. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That's all of me.